Good evening, everybody. Hope everybody's well. Um, we're outside today on uh, my front porch, front patio. Just such a beautiful day. I just uh, thought it'd be a, a great venue. I've never done Wednesday night prayer meeting uh, outside before that I know of, and um, especially at my house. So anyway, just thought it was such a beautiful day. It would be nice to meet out here. You can hear my roosters crowing. Uh, I got one out here that it likes to attack my, attack us or anybody that walks up. So uh, I told Tana, it sure would be funny for y'all if this rooster decided to attack in the middle of prayer meeting. So y'all uh, y'all pray that my rooster behaves tonight. If not, I got my stick right here. I'll beat him off with my stick. That'll be funny too. But anyway, um, I'm, I think y'all read my email today. I'm, I am feeling, uh, I mean, yes, from Monday, I am feeling a little bit like Apostle Paul must have felt um, when he was not able to visit his churches like he wanted to, uh, not able to see them. And that's a, a lot the way I feel about you folks. I love y'all, miss y'all, and uh, long to be with you. I ran into Charlene. She came uh, by the uh, fellowship hall today doing some cleanup in one of the back rooms back there. And uh, by the way, she, uh, well, anyway, I'll tell you that story later. But anyway, um, she said, what are we going to do after this is all over? And I said, well, when all this is over, we're going to have one of the biggest, uh, greatest, uh, whatever, big shindig uh, as a church, a big dinner on the ground or a big cookout or, or something church wide. And we're going to have a big celebration. It's going to be like a big giant family reunion. And uh, I can't wait for that day, and, and I know y'all can't either. But, uh, you know, we're joining each other online, and we are not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. I don't believe God's disappointed in us. Of course, right now we don't have a choice uh, in a manner of speaking. So, But we are gathering together uh, online like this, and we're having, you know, we're, we're enjoying it as much as we possibly can. But uh, thank you for joining us. I am also... Uh, recording this for youtube to upload later uh i'm gonna try this be the third time you know the old saying goes uh um you know the third time's the charm so i, I hope that's the case tonight it didn't work last week didn't work the week before on youtube so uh i'm gonna try it one more time and uh see if it works for the youtube crowd but thanks for everybody who joined us on facebook live um so um let me uh, make this announcement. Glenda Hatcher is, uh, and our Baptist Nurses Fellowship has uh, sent this thank you note. And because we haven't been meeting together and so forth, I've uh, not been able to read it to you. But um, Glenda and the Baptist Nurses Fellowship is wanting to thank everybody uh, that worked with the dental clinic. So uh, let me just read what was written on their behalf. On behalf of the Baptist Nursing Fellowship and the Thomas County Baptist Association, thank you for all that the congregation did to make the mobile dental clinic such a success. Volunteers, which included those that worked registration, nurses who assessed the clients prior to their appointment, and those who assisted with security were greatly needed and appreciated. Also greatly appreciated was the food provided, bananas and applesauce for the clients and salad for the workers. Thank you again for... Uh, for giving so generously in so many ways, uh, serving him, Glenda Hatcher, and the Baptist Nursing Fellowship. So uh, thank you all for serving in that way. Now, uh, I don't know if y'all saw my announcement about an hour ago to reminding you to join us tonight, but uh, I thought I would it would be fun for us to think about or share what are some of the family projects that y'all been working on uh, since we've been quarantined. Um, for example, I'm sitting out here on our brick uh, patio, and uh, it's been uh, need in need of a lot of work lately. Well, Caleb, who has uh, been, you know, uh, had a lot of free time on his hand, uh, he has been out here cleaning it up, and I would show you, but I'd have to move my devices and readjust them and set them back up. But he's got it looking really good out here, and, and y'all are going to have to throw me a, a lifeline or something because my wife's trying to lasso me into painting. And uh, I for hate to admit it, but I despise painting. But anyway, you know, I'll do what, what uh, I can to help her. <laughs> but anyway, what are some of the things y'all been doing? I'm looking at some of the comments. Um, some See, 
Desiree said they've been doing painting and yard work. Hey, Desiree, when y'all finish painting over there, come over here and help Tana. She would love uh, love the help. Um, Charlotte says Scott dug up a chunk of the driveway, hacked up a root, and put the puzzle back together. <laughs> that sounds fun. Sounds good. What else? Some of y'all share some other things y'all are doing. Uh, I know our neighbors, uh, if they're tuned in uh they're they're working on a garden and things like that i see glenda says they're washing blinds washing windows inside and out uh so we're getting a lot of things done around here uh, in your homes and i know a lot of the kids are doing some extra activities um and parents are having to be very creative with uh the activities for the kids as well so i see a lot of y'all are logged on and and watching and uh let's see ruth's Fuller says uh, they're doing their flower bed makeover and cleaning house. I also heard that Bill had gone fishing uh, some today. So, uh, Bill, I hope you caught some fish. Um, Seal uh, says taking Hannah back and forth to therapy. Well, I'm sure that's not too fun for Hannah, uh, but we're certainly praying for her. Um, Mikey says working no days off in the machine shop. My gosh, Mikey, you need a break then, don't you, son? Gail Floyd says she's spring cleaning. That's good. Uh, Kyle says, I just do what... <laughs> he just does what Katie tells him to do. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> Tomorrow's Katie's birthday. Happy birthday, Katie. Uh, Deborah cleaning her closet. Cassidy, Cisco's still working regular hours. She's busy with four kids and no extra time for me. Oh, Cassidy, you need a lifeline, don't you? Um, let's see. Who is this? Kristen... I'm having Epley Elam be uh, repainting their new house outside now here in Ohio. Miss everyone in Thomasville. Well, yeah, let's, watching from Ohio. Hello, Kristen. Kirsten. Kirsten. Oh, I'm reading it wrong. The print is small for some reason. Okay. Hey, Kirsten. Sorry about that. John Bolton, John, and Zach uh, are golfing while social distancing in the front yard. <laughs> that sounds fun. Bonnie says Tommy has uh, aerated the yard today. And uh, Wayne says just trying to keep bread on the shelves. Amen. Hey, hey, Wayne, we appreciate that. We need the bread. Uh, Donnie Satig, our buddy from Eunice, cleaning the house and cutting the grass. Yeah, that's what I just told my wife I had on my agenda this weekend is more yard work. Andrea Webb is back home, and her project is recovering from surgery. If y'all... I was going to talk about that in a minute. Andre had emergency appendectomy uh, Sunday night, early wee hours Monday morning, I believe. And uh, But anyway, at least she said it's a home project now instead of having to be in the hospital. Um, Janet Wilford is still working full time with some days working from home. So very grateful for that, she says. Uh, Tana, <laughs> yeah. Tana says all in favor of preacher. Yeah, right. Well, we're not voting tonight. This is not business conference. There'll be no votes. I know I would get outvoted. <laughs> Dale's putting in a garden. Will you go, girl? Put in that garden. All right. We got a lot of good comments going on. So y'all are finding things to do to occupy your time. And see, that's, uh, I'll look at Charla. She's voting for me, uh, against me. You're actually voting against me, Charla. <laughs> And then, Bonnie, you too. Good gracious. Never mind. I'm going to quit reading comments now and move right along. <laughs> but um, it's good to have all this time. I know it's not normal. Uh, it's not good in one sense, but it's it can be good. And, and finding the good in difficult situations is, is helpful and beneficial for us emotionally. And uh, we'll talk more about what our governor said later on tonight. And uh, But I wanted us to go into our prayer needs time. And um, if y'all want to keep sharing some of the things, but y'all can also share some prayer requests. Tana is right inside the house. I've got the window open right here. She can hear me, and um, she's watching and helping me record some of our prayer requests in case I miss any. Um, but we do want to remember those that have lost loved ones um, due to this virus. Also, uh, Charlie Copeland's mother passed away, not due to the virus, but uh, we do want to remember he and their family. Uh, she passed away this week, and let's remember them. And Because people that are losing loved ones can't even have funerals and public services, so it's very hard uh, for a family to have that type of closure when they can't even have a time with their family to uh, have a service and bury their loved one. 
uh, like they normally would. So be praying for these families. Um, let's pray for all of our health care workers. Uh, we have many in our church. We have uh, s- several in our family that we're remembering. And um, they're on the front lines and uh, facing this every day. So uh, let's pray for um, all the patients that are diagnosed with uh, the virus. Uh, let's pray that God give them the strength that they need to overcome that virus and to survive it and to um, uh, just be able to live a, a long and prosperous life. Um, so anyway, let's pray for that. And uh, I mentioned Andrea Webb earlier. Andrea had the emergency appendectomy. She's home recovering. Um, Donna Laws is home. I say home. She's not home. She's uh, back at the Presbyterian home in Quitman. Um, Hannah Tehe is uh, uh, the update. If you're on the House of Prayer email, you got the update. Cat, her cast has been removed from both arms. Uh, she has a boot on her right foot, uh, but she can't put any weight on it yet. But uh, just keep the prayers going for Hannah. Um, let's see, Danny Hatchell uh, is, y'all know he had surgery this week and um, uh, to amputate his leg above the knee. And that was because of the spreading of the calciphylaxis that was just creating awful pain. And uh, it was not getting any better. And it was, again, spreading. So they opted to uh, have that leg amputated. And he's the surgery went well. Uh, there was no excessive bleeding. Um, and we just need to pray that his, his surgical pain, as well as the former pain he was having, would, would be uh, gone. And uh, we also need to remember to pray for Pam. She's there 24-7 giving care uh, to Danny, as well as, of course, the nurses and doctors as well. But uh, she's been the number one caregiver for, for him for uh, this, this time. And also for their children, uh, as you can imagine, it's difficult for anybody when you have a loved one in the hospital and you can't even go in there and, and visit with them. Uh, let's remember Bill Mullen. Bill um, is going to have to have, well, he's waiting on a PET scan, but right now he's waiting for his insurance to approve that PET scan, and uh, his insurance is not wanting to. They're wanting to go another route first, but the uh, PET scan is the most conclusive um, to find out if the uh, cancer has reoccurred. Uh, so let's just be praying for Bill and uh, for that whole situation. Um if you have some other prayer requests, you can comment on those. Uh, mention those in the comment. T- Tana will help me write those down, and we'll get those added to our church prayer list. Um, we did not get a printed list out in the email this week, um, but uh, we'll talk more about that uh, later. But let me uh, lead us in prayer. Would you join me in lifting these up to the Lord? Father, uh, again, as we have called out these names uh, here tonight, you have heard each name. And you, Lord, you know our hearts for each of these people. Lord, you know how, how desperate they are for help and for healing. And God, I pray that you would do what only you can do. Lord, you created us in the first place. You know our bodies inside and out. You know what it would take for our bodies to be healed. You could touch our bodies with your healing hand in all of the sickness the virus, Lord, those with cancer, uh, those, Lord, uh, who are suffering with any type of ailments, recovering from surgeries, Lord, dealing with uh, serious issues, Lord, their bodies would be healed completely. And Lord, we pray that you would do that. Or Lord, you could use the doctors. You could use surgical procedures. You could use medications. Lord, you could use anything you wanted to. So, Lord, if that's your will, we pray that you would do that. And, Lord, we we pray that you would encourage those who are sick. Lord, especially those who are cut off in this time from their loved ones, who are not able to see uh, their loved ones and visit with them. I pray, Father, that you would just encourage their hearts. Lord, I pray that you would um, just give them your your peace. Lord, give them a sense, Lord, a, a literal awareness of your presence with them, that that room where they are, that hospital room, their bedroom, or wherever they're at, Lord, would be a sanctuary where you meet with them and they meet with you. Father, I pray for those who are giving care, Lord, for the family members who are able to be with them and 
ministering to their needs. Lord, I know they get tired and weary. And there's an emotional toll that it takes as well. So, Lord, I pray that you'd give them strength and grace and hold them up, Lord, as they try to hold up their loved, sick loved one. Lord, I pray for those who've lost loved ones. We lift up Charlie's family. And, Lord, those who've lost loved ones from this virus, Lord, please minister comfort and peace to them. May they uh, know, Lord, that you're there with them, walking with them through this valley of the shadow of death. And, Lord, I pray for our health care workers, our doctors, our nurses, Lord, our first responders. Lord, all the people who are out there on the front lines fighting this virus. Lord, our, our scientists and researchers. God, just protect them. Please keep them safe from this virus. Lord, please slow the spread of this virus. Please take it away. Please, Lord, protect your people. Please protect our church and our church families and everybody associated with our church families. Lord, protect this city and this state and this nation. And God, again, even our world. We know that you can do anything and that nothing's impossible with you. And Lord, at the same time I pray that, I pray that your purposes for this would be accomplished. Whatever you can and are doing, Lord, I know that you can take a bad situation and you can get good from it. And God, I thank you that that's because of your sovereignty and your power. So we just pray for grace. We pray for strength. We pray for patience. God, we need that fruit of the Spirit to be manifested and produced in our lives. We need patience. It's, it's getting longer than we anticipated. And Lord, things seem to be tightening instead of loosening. So God, please give us the patience and the long-suffering that we need. Then in the same time, Lord, fill our hearts with joy, with peace, with love, and all the fruits of the Spirit, gentleness, goodness, and faith, and meekness, and self-control. Lord, see us through these days. And Lord, in the meantime, just help us to be the people we need to be and to stay in touch with one another and encourage each other as we have opportunity. We ask all this in your name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I wanted to share something with y'all um, tonight. Um, this week, next week, is Holy Week. Uh, this Sunday is Palm Sunday, and I've never not been in church on Palm Sunday uh, that I can remember in my entire life. Um, but I want us to think about, and as we prepare for Holy Week, which begins this coming Sunday, um, I want to share with you uh, a message tonight or a Bible study tonight that I've actually shared with you about 11 years ago this month. In fact, uh, April the 5th, 2009, I shared this with you. And so this is April the 1st, uh, 2020. Uh, so uh, I want to share it with you again because I think it's very appropriate, especially considering the times we're living in. But you know you know why what we're celebrating when we celebrate Palm Sunday? Most people would say, well, we're celebrating... Jesus triumphal entry when he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and the people laid down their garments and palm leaves on the road in front of him. And that yeah that is true. That is what we're celebrating, but it's not completely or the whole truth. Jesus triumphal entry into Jerusalem one week before he was crucified foreshadows an even greater event still to come in our possible very near future. Do you know what that event is? It's the next triumphal entry. That is Jesus' second coming to establish his kingdom on earth. Now, don't confuse the rapture and the second coming. The rapture will be the next event to take place when Jesus meets us in the clouds and we go to meet him there and go on to heaven. Then the seven-year tribulation takes place and then Jesus Christ comes back in the second coming. Uh, and will make the, a very similar journey. In fact, the exact same journey he made on Palm Sunday. He will make from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. And by the way, the second coming of Christ is the single great the, is the greatest single theme in Scripture. There are approximately three hundred prophecies in the Old Testament that talked about the first coming of Christ, Christmas. There are more than eight times that many. Verses describing the second coming 
of Christ. So in total, some 2,400 verses throughout the Old and New Testament reveal God's promises about the second coming of Christ. Combining the gospel accounts, only three times covering about three to five verses in three years leading up to his Passion Week did Jesus speak of his death, burial, and resurrection. And only twice did Jesus speak of his suffering during Passion Week to his disciples. But 21 times, covering 157 verses, even in his last week before his death, Jesus spoke about his second coming than he, more than he did his own death. That's a big deal. When Jesus and the scriptures speak more about something than even his birth or his death or even his resurrection, I think it's important for us to pay attention to that. And certainly, we don't discount the importance of his birth. We would never discount the importance of his death nor his resurrection. But we cannot discount the importance of his second coming. And Matthew 21, verses 1 through 13, is one of the places where we read about Jesus' first triumphal entry. And I want to share with you, uh, 11 years ago, I shared with you five things. But today, I only, I only want to share with you three of... Um, things in Jesus' first triumphal entry that will be repeated in his second triumphal entry, but on a grander scale. The first one is, of course, we know that uh, in Matthew 21, verse 1, he begins on the Mount of Olives. Okay, Matthew 21, verse 1. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethlehem at the Mount of Olives, okay, so that's where they were. The Mount of Olives is on the east uh, side of um, Jerusalem, overlooks the Kidron Valley, and up, up against the wall there, the city of Jerusalem, is the eastern gate. Now, when Jesus comes back again, the second coming, that's where he's coming to. Did you know the Bible says when he leaves heaven to come back to earth, you know where his feet will touch first? The Mount of Olives. Here's, a, here's the prophecy, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. So when he comes back, he's going to land on the Mount of Olives. His feet will land there. And then there will be this great earthquake that will take place. Well, the eastern gate is what, if you're standing on the Mount of Olives and looking toward Jerusalem, you would be looking at the eastern gate. I've been there, and I've seen that very view. And I wish wished every believer, in fact, I wished we uh, could go. I, there's an opportunity to go later this year. I don't know if the Lord would open that door for us to do it, but I would love for, I believe every Christian would benefit from going to Israel one day. But listen to Ezekiel 44, verse 1 through 3. The prophet says, Then he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces east, and it was shut. And he said to me, This gate shall remain shut. It shall not be opened, and no one shall enter by it. For the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered by it. Therefore it shall remain shut. Only the prince may sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by way of the vestibule of the gate and shall go out by the same way. So if you go to Jerusalem today and you stand on the Mount of Olives and you look toward Jerusalem, you'll see the eastern gate, but you'll see that it's bricked up. It's walled up. You can't go in. Nobody can come out. How? Why? Well, it was prophesied. The eastern gate is referred to in Nehemiah. And uh, it says in Nehemiah, the glory of the Lord came into the house, that is, came into the temple by the way of that gate that faces toward the east. So it was, it was uh, bricked up, closed off, because it was, had been sanctified by the presence of Jesus Christ going through it, and it was being reserved for his second coming. The Golden Gate is what it's referred to also. And um, it's one of the 11 entry gates into Jerusalem. Of course, you can't enter it now, uh, but it's sealed shut. It was sealed in the 16th century, and it was walled up by Muslim conquerors, the Ottoman Turks. 
1530 A.D. And there's a cemetery planted in the Kidron Valley there between the Mount of Olives and the Eastern Gate because they believed that this would block the entrance of the Jewish Messiah through that gate. If they walled it up and if they put a cemetery there, a Muslim cemetery, mind you, that the Messiah wouldn't come that way. Well, what they don't realize is there's going to be an earthquake and it's going to rip that cemetery wide open and it's just going to make a pathway for Christ. There won't be any dead bodies there. He's going to swallow them up in the earthquake. Okay, so God's got all this already planned out when he comes back. So Jesus entered Jerusalem the first time through that gate around 30 AD as he came down from the Mount of Olives and he entered the temple. And Ezekiel says concerning this closed gate that the prince, that's Jesus, that's the Messiah, would enter it again. So Jesus, having entered the city, said he would not be seen again until Jerusalem acknowledged him. Now listen to what he says. I want to read Matthew 23 and look at verse 37. O Jerusalem, he's mourning over Jerusalem. But after, after his mourning for that city, he said, I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, remember, this is not, he's already come into uh, the temple. The the, uh, um, triumphal entry has already happened at this point. So he's not talking about the first. He's talking about the second. He said, you won't see me again until I come back. And people do this all over again and wave the branches and say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So um, this eastern gate is presently blocked off by the Arabs, and they consider it their exclusive property. It's sealed up. But one day, Jesus, the Messiah, will land on the Mount of Olives with all of his saints. By the way, we're coming back with him. Guess what? Uh, Well, we'll talk about that in the next point. And we and he will walk right down the same path, right through the eastern gate and into the temple and occupy the throne of David, which God told David, I will one of your descendants will rule from this throne forever. That's where Jesus will rule from. That's what we're celebrating on the on the Palm Sunday. That's what's coming up this Sunday. That's what we're going to be thinking about. Second thing I want to share with you, okay? So the first thing was, it began on the Mount of Olives. First one did. Second one, second triumphal entry will begin on the Mount of Olives. Okay, so here's the second thing. First time he rides in on a colt with his disciples with him. Here's the verse in Matthew 21, verses 2 through 9. So he tells his disciples, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. See, what they cried the first time, Jesus said they're going to cry the second time. Remember, we just talked about that. But here, in the second point, Jesus comes in on a colt the first time, and his disciples with him. Now, you know what's going to happen the second time? He was on a colt the first time. He's going to be on a white horse the second time. And he came with his disciples the first time into Jerusalem, and he's coming with his disciples the second time. We're coming with him. Here's the scriptures. Revelation 7, 9, and 10. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. 
crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You know what Hosanna means? Hosanna means, save us, we pray. And that's what they were singing. Salvation belongs to our God. Hosanna in the highest. Now, those are his saints. Okay, now when we turn to chapter 19, verse 11, we read this in Revelation. John says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. And it talks about later on, verse 14, And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. But have you ever ridden a white horse? Well, you don't have to practice if you never have. You're going to be able to because you will be following him. We will be following him on white horses. So the first time Jesus rode a colt with his disciples, they didn't ride a colt. They walked. They weighed palm branches. We're going to be with him. We're going to be riding the horses with him, coming into Jerusalem, making that, that journey with him, just like the first time. Zechariah 14.5 says, Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. So what will we do when we arrive with him? The Bible tells us that Jesus is coming to establish his kingdom on earth. Revelation 11, 15 tells us what we'll be doing. The seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. In chapter 19, uh, where we just were, it says it talks about Jesus coming and being titled King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and uh, that we, his saints, will reign with him. The reason that he's bringing his saints with him is because we get to reign with him. And that's in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6, what he says. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection, the rapture. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So now this coming Palm Sunday, it's what I want you to think about. We're not just remembering a past. Palm Sunday is about looking for Christ coming back and that he's coming back to the Mount of Olives. He's going to take the same path. He's bringing us with him. We're going to be on the white horses as well. And one more thing I want to share with you. Verses 8 and 9 of Matthew 21 says, They worshipped him with palm branches. Now this is very important because we're going to do something like that um, this week, this Sunday. I want you to think about uh, that, and I'm going to share with you a project that we're going to do together as a church for Palm Sunday and next week. So verse 8 and 9 of Matthew 21 says, And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road, 